Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Virtual Church. That's right, here we are gathered together electronically, and thank God for this opportunity. Debbie and I were just talking this morning. Where would we be without electronics? Things like Zoom and things like this opportunity that we have to record. And uh, even still, we can be connected in this way. One of the ways we're being connected today is through drive-in church. Uh, because of the governor's edict that allows doesn't allow us to meet inside, we're going to meet outside. So drive-in church at 9 o'clock this morning. And, and so we're looking forward to that as well. But here we are. And today I want to just proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lift him up. And the issues that you're facing, as we keep our eyes focused on him, I believe that the, the issues that you're dealing with will melt into his love and melt into his strength, and melt into his care. I love songs that declare doctrine. Martin Luther, clear back in the 1500s, would write doctrine into songs to teach the people. And so today I, I wanted to just pick up a good, solid doctrinal tune that we would be able to sing, and in singing, declare truths. And so, would you join with me as we sing, Oh, praise the name of Jesus. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance seat by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Lift this chorus Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise His name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again, O oh, trampled death. Where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days. Days. I will sing your praise. 
praise Him, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Lord, I believe in you. I'll always believe in you Though I can't see you with my eyes Deep in my heart your presence I find Lord, I believe in you And I'll keep my trust in you Say what they may, no one can take this joy away. Lord, I believe. Say that chorus again. Lord, I believe. Say, Lord, I believe in you. I'll always believe in you. Let this be a faith declaration. Though I can't see you with my eyes. together as we pray. Lord, today we declare our belief in you. Your, your body that was 
uh, died on the cross and placed in the grave and rose again from the grave and then ascended into heaven only gives us hope and life and the strength that we need to, to live a life that is, as the scripture says, being more than a conqueror. So today I speak the life flow of the Holy Spirit into our lives. I, sp I speak the life flow of the Holy Spirit to those who are hurting today. I pray the healing balm uh, that the covering of the Holy Spirit would be upon them and that you will love them and help them. I pray that there would be uh, a release of anxiety and fear. I pray the goodness of God that will sweep through our land and through our own individual hearts as we put our total trust in you. We thank you, Lord, and as we have declared this morning, you are our God. In you, we place our trust. And Psalm 27 says, because of that, we need not fear. Hallelujah. You are our light. In Jesus' name, amen. That was some good words there to those songs. I, I trust that you lifted them up with me, and we proclaimed his name. Amen. Thanks, Debbie. Appreciate you. Just a couple of announcements that I want to share with you. I mentioned earlier that uh, virtual church, obviously, is going on right now. But also drive-in church. And drive-in church, who knows how long we'll be doing this, but th this is our first day today. And if you're watching this in time and still want to come down for drive-in church, it begins at 9 o'clock. Uh, and we have people out here that are going to be directing uh, where you're supposed to park and stuff. It will be a 45-minute to an hour service. Uh, the building will be closed, but you can come, and if you have a radio in your car, you'll be able to listen in because we have an FM transmitter. So come, be part of Drive-In Church this week and uh, for the foreseeable future, all right? That's going to be, that's something new that's going to be kind of exciting. Also, I wanted to share with you that uh, something I shared last week, that we have an opportunity to put on a webinar, webinar through Zoom, and we're joining forces with Thrivent Financial, and we have a seminar that's entitled Financial Wisdom That Impacts the Kingdom. Do you know the Bible is filled with ways that we can use our finances to impact the kingdom and indeed to be a blessing to us? And so if you're interested in something like that, you'll see the information on the screen. Be sure and contact Pastor Donna and let her know that you're interested, and we'll talk about how and where and when that's going to take place. Also. I want to say thank you for your giving. I want to thank you for the blessing of your giving. As we give, we, we see the hand of God doing some good things in our fellowship, and we are blessing people. So let's, let's keep on being a blessing. And one more thing, I want to remind you to pray. Let's pray. Yes, let's pray individually. Let's pray. Let's turn our faces to the Lord, and let's ask God to do some miraculous things in our lives. But also, let's pray corporately. And on your screen, you'll see the times that we can pray corporately. And I'm asking you to join together and pray corporately together. It's on Zoom, and if you have access to Zoom, you can join us on Wednesday nights at 5.45. And, and if uh, you can, you could join Pastor Donna on Monday mornings at 7.30 on Facebook. And then I'm, I'm doing my own time of fasting and prayer on on Mondays, and, and if you want to join in, you know, if we do things together, we are more powerful in his incredible strength. And so let's pray, and let's keep praying, and seeking the face of the Lord. All right. Well, everybody, here I am with uh, Carol. Carol's made a big difference in our church, and I and, uh, just... Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Love the dog barking. It's just, it's just touching. That's all right. We'll be fine. But this is her last week with us, and it's it's tough to say goodbye. And Carol, I just want to say thank you for being so great. You. you really have been great. You have touched our lives over and over. And you thought about the ins and outs of ministry, the details of touching people. I'm just blessed by you. Thank you. And it seems like whenever I needed encouragement, you showed up with cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the cookie lady. And you and you just bless me. And and I, I thought, what can I do for Carol? And so I thought we'd give you this coin. This is the New Hope coin. And this coin is a is a coin that is used to honor people who are volunteers. And it's really the highest thing that I can give to you is a thank you for all that you've done. 
And uh, I know that you've done things that I don't even know, but yet I've felt. You're one of those kind of people. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. All right? Yep. And I know that I know you're moving. Yep. And for those of you who don't know, she's going to South Carolina. You bet. And, uh, you know, South Carolina is a beautiful place. It's stinking hot and muggy. <laughs> and, stinking hot here. <laughs> but it's not muggy. There's a difference. Oh, yeah. When it's 104, I don't care. It's yeah. still hot. <laughs> but we want to say we love you. Thank you. I love you, too. I really do. It's, uh, uh, it's going to take uh, a long No, it might not take as long as that. I've been blessed uh, over this uh, last year or two. Um, and I don't know why I won't be continue to be blessed, and I'll yeah. find a church. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, people that are as kind and and uh, loving as New Hope, and I still have New Hope. <laughs> so, you know, and I'll be back. You can catch us virtually. You bet, I will, and wow. I'll be back. So. Well, let me pray for you. you bet. Lord, I thank you for Carol, and Lord, I just pray the blessing of the Lord over her, the peace of God over her. All the things, the little details that can just pop up every time you turn around when you're moving, it's, it's, it's myriad. But Lord, I, I pray that there'll be a supernatural pillar of fire that will just guide her and direct her and bless her and help her, protect her, provide in every everything. And let this moment, as difficult as it is, let it be a, a moment filled with you. And in that presence, there'll be certain peace. And as she travels, as she does what she does. Let her eyes be wide open to the ways and the means of God and the purposes of God. Let them be lived out. And as she adjusts to life back in South Carolina, use her. And Lord, let her have a sense of fulfillment in her heart. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. Come see me. <laughs> yeah, come see me. We're continuing on in our series on fit faith based in the book of James. And we're using these little measurements of faith that help us understand not just the living out of our faith, but it helps us measure our level of faith. For example, these past couple of weeks, we've looked at how enduring suffering and trials and we go through the suffering and trials and, and our level of faith grows as we go through the suffering and trials in our life. We looked at how to resist the devil. That was part eight in our series that we skipped ahead to. But we, how to resist the devil. And, and then last, last week we looked at obeying God and what is it, how when we obey God, is, it's a measurement of literally of our faith. The more that I obey God, the more faith I have. The less that I obey God, the less faith that I have. So these are just different measurements of faith. Well, today we're going to be looking at how we need to overcome prejudice. And James gives us some clear uh, guidelines on what it takes to overcome prejudice. What a timely word for today, right out of the book of James. And so we're going to look at James chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Let's read it together. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed. It is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery 
also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. Verse 12. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Let's take a look at a few points here as we've gone through this passage. First, first of all, in verse 1, it says, My dear brothers, he says, How can you claim to have faith in your, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? How can you say that you are of Christ if you wrap your life in favoritism. You see, the problem is favoritism. Favoritism and, and not just the recognition of differences in people. Now, I want to cl I draw this cl clear line, and that is it's not talking about the differences that we all have because we are different. And, and there's different races, there's different uh, talents, there's different giftings, and so on and so forth. But he's talking about showing favoritism towards one over another. Now, I looked up favoritism, and one in Strong's, it says this. He says, The fault of one who, when called on to give judgment, has respect of the outward circumstances of man and not to their intrinsic merit. So he's saying a favoritism is when we're making a judgment based on the outward circumstances of man. And he goes on. And so he prefers as more worthy one who is rich, high-born, or powerful to another who does not have these qualities. Prejudice is that ability, I should say, that you are judging somebody by their looks and have a preconceived opinion that really is not based on reason or actual experience. And so we make a judgment based on somebody without even knowing them. Without, and, and maybe even drawing a judgment based on how you know somebody else. So he's talking here about having a prejudice against people and, and indeed from their different backgrounds as well. You know, I, I realize that we all can draw prejudices if we're not careful. We all can box somebody in. I remember living in a particular area of our nation and I had people asking me what my heritage was. And I would tell them, well, I'm a mutt. And they didn't like that too much. Because if I was of this nationality, then I was supposed to live in this part of town and drive this kind of car and have this kind of job. Or if I was of this kind of na uh, nationality, then I was going to live in this part of town and drive this kind of car and this kind of job. And indeed, the town was divided up according to the different nationalities. Because we are comfortable, if I could say that, in drawing boxes around people and then putting them into those boxes. But we are not to have prejudice against people. And why? Because prejudice leads to unfavorable results, like discrimination. Let me give you a few examples. Hitler, he had views of the Jews that led to genocide. What about Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese and that led to a nationwide distrust of the Japanese and indeed the ultimate internment of thousands of people. What about apartheid in South Africa? It involved racial segregation where non-whites were viewed as unfit to partake in the voting process. What about something like bullying? Bullying is often caused by a prejudice against people who are different. For example, the cool kids are the ones that are wearing a certain brand of clothing. So they pick on one kid who is wearing a dress that she or her mom made. We have these prejudices and it permeates our society. But we need to understand that God wants us to live above that. Verse 2, he goes on, he says, For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? When we are showing 
preference to people and how we treat them. He's saying, James is saying here that we have evil motives. So I asked the question, what are evil motives? One answer I found was this. Showing favoritism infers that there are some people who, by their status, whether it be economic or race or sex or education, are more important than others. Now, understand this. When we are showing favoritism, we are in essence saying, you are more valuable than you. We are drawing a distinction by something that is maybe their economics or maybe their race. When I speak of economics, I speak of you know, the rich-poor uh, category. But Jesus is our example. Remember that. We're supposed to live like Jesus. Jesus did not do this. While he gives warnings to some, for example, it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, and he qualifies that, his treatment of the rich is still the same as the treatment to the poor. And he went to the rich man's home as well as he went to the poor man's home. Which leads to the question, how do we love? I like what Warren Worsby says. He says, we love to show love to others and by accepting them for what they are and seeing them as persons for whom Christ died. We've got to love people and see them as Jesus sees them. And Jesus sees each person as a person valuable enough for him to give their life for. Here's a list. Jesus knew that Zacchaeus was a publican. But he went to his house anyway. Jesus knew that the rich man was rich, but he didn't treat him as one. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, but took him into his inner circle anyway. Jesus knew that the leper had a contagious disease, but he touched him anyway. Mary Magdalene did not have the best of past, but he befriended her anyway. Pilate was a corrupt leader, but he submitted to him anyway. The woman at the well was a, of a different breed. She was a Samaritan, not to mention she was a woman. But he ministered to her anyway. Matthew was a tax collector. They hated tax collectors. But he was a tax collector. But you know what Jesus did? He drafted him into his disciples anyway. Peter was unruly and brash. But he chose him anyway. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying here? Jesus understood something. Every person had value. And every person added to him. Even Judas was used, his actions were used in order to see the fulfillment of Jesus dying on the cross. You see, each person brought a different facet of life to Jesus. It's the same with us. You know, sometimes the very person that we reject is the person that we need. And we've got to be careful that we reject people based on a particular category. Rather, we need to embrace them and love them. You know, I, I found some, a unique passage here that I just want to share with you. And, and it kind of just said, hmm, it made me think. And so I'm just going to give it to you and let you think as well. It's found in Luke chapter 7. And it's talking about Jesus where he entered Capernaum. In verse 2, it says this, And there a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. So here we get it. We see the centurion. He has a, a sick servant. And so he heard that Jesus was there. And so he sent some elders of the Jews to Jesus to ask him to heal his servant. Verse 4. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. And this is what they said. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Stop right there. They thought that this person, because of his status and because of what he has done for the church and he, and he even helped build the synagogue, they said to Jesus, he deserves to have you come. And it seems to me that's a little bit of a favoritism, isn't it? What, what's intriguing to me was in verse 6, the very next word, so Jesus went with them. And I begin to ask myself a question. 
Why did Jesus go with them? Did he go with them in order to appease a person that was uh, favorable towards the church? Or did he go simply because he knew he had to go? I don't have the whole answer to that, other than to think that I'm wondering and I'm believing that even if he did not, because we see this in other areas of Scripture, even if he did not do all these things for his synagogue, Jesus would have gone. But here the, the persons, the, the elders and the leaders, they were saying, you know what? Even they were having favoritism towards people who had blessed them. But Jesus went anyway. I don't think Jesus' was, motive was because you know, of the, of the uh, things that this person had done. Jesus' motive was simply to go and heal. And I think we have to develop motives like that. Even myself, I don't, want, I don't like to know what people give in our church. And one of the reasons is because if there comes a time when two people are in the hospital and I don't want to be tempted to go visit the, the rich person and not the poor person, both of them need to be visited and both of them need to be cared for. Well, in favoritism and in showing prejudice, sometimes we can knock ourselves out of the real blessing that God has for us. And so we go on in verse 5. And he says, listen to me, dear brothers. Hasn't God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? I could talk a lot about that, but for the sake of time, let's move on. Verse 8. Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. You see, James is pointing out here the wrongness of showing partiality. And he brings up this phrase, the royal law. The royal law, it's, it's the royal law because frankly, it's the supreme law by which all other laws are based. And indeed, it's the law of love, which looks past the outward, past the superficial, and past the distinctions of people, and begins to show kindness to a person in spite of distasteful qualities. We look at somebody who's just a little different than us, and we treat them differently. But here he's saying there's a royal law, and the royal law is we love each person because each person's valuable. And each person is valuable to God. And because each person is valuable to God, they should be valuable to me. And so we see, yes, we need to love each other. And we need to take care of each other's. You know, the sad thing is in the church, in the church, we could have religious prejudices. We might, you may have said these things or you may have heard these things. Big churches are so impersonal. Really? How about small churches are cliquish? Or preachers are only out for themselves. The church is filled with gossip. I don't know how you can be saved and be a Republican or a Democrat. I, all that the church wants is money. Or how about this one? Hand raisers are weird. Tongue talkers are demon possessed. Women should not be leaders. Children should keep quiet. Do I need to go on? I'll give you a few more. How about you can't dress that way? You can't eat that way? You can't drink that way? You can't, you can't, you can't. People have their prejudices on what they determine to be holy. But you see, what God determines to be holy is an act of the heart. And so what we need to do is say, Lord Jesus, open my eyes that I would see what you see and love people like you want to love. Which brings me to kind of a wrap-up here. And Debbie, help me out, would you please? And in this wrap-up, we're going to see how do we overcome prejudice? Well, we see in verse 12. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. Verse 13, there will be no mercy for those who have not been shown mercy to others. But if you will have been merciful, God will be merciful 
when he judges you. How do you overcome prejudice? It's wrapped up in this word, mercy. Mercy simply is defined as kindness or goodwill towards the miserable and the afflicted. Kindness and goodwill towards the miserable and the afflicted. And then it says, joined with a desire to help them. That's, that's what Strong says in his Greek lexicon. Joined with the desire to help them. Mercy is not just a love. It's a love in action. Where we are looking at the plight of people. And mercy is when you see the plight and he goes on. I like this word joined. Joined with the desire to help them. Can you imagine what would happen in our world? Can you imagine what would happen in our state? Let's just, can you imagine what would happen on our block if we as a people would simply show out the mercy that we have received? And when we show out the mercy that we have received, there's a continual flow of mercy through my life. It doesn't just stop with me like a dam. It flows through, through me to touch people, to show mercy to them, bringing life to him. We have been shown mercy. And because we have been shown mercy, we need to show mercy to others. So let me give you this little phrase. It's this. Yes, know that they're unique. And we are all unique, aren't we? Our races were different. Our, our economic status were different. Our likes and dislikes are different. We have different characters. We have a different, I call it a, a, a fingerprint, the different fingerprint of personality. Rather than judging those different fingerprints of personality, love them. Because Jesus does. So, yes, we are different. It's okay to acknowledge our differences. But we need to remember our differences don't separate us. Our differences bring us together. So we need to love them. Why? And, and we need to show mercy to them. Why? Because we have been shown mercy ourselves. So as we wrap this up, I just want to pray with you through a song. It's a song that I, I think of quite often in my own heart, in my own life, where I would say, Lord Jesus, just purify my heart. Make my heart what you want it to be. Cleanse out the prejudices. Wash out the little uh, the biases that I have against people. And Lord, purify me. And then open my eyes that I might see how you see. Can I, can I just say, it's really simple, isn't it? It's not like five steps. It's simply, Lord, change my heart. And then, watch him. He will fill you with a love towards people. He may even fill you with a love towards people that up to this point you have hated. One of the things I have found, if I don't get along with somebody, I begin to, I begin to pray for them. You know what happens? A change takes place. It either takes place in me or it takes place in them, but it takes place as we begin to show mercy and love. But it only happens because we ourselves have received mercy and love. Sing this with me. It goes like this. A pure heart That's what I long heart that follows hard after thee, a pure heart, that's what I long for, a heart that follows hard after thee. hide your word so that sin will not come in a heart that's undivided but one you rule and reign a 
heart that beats compassion that pleases you my Lord a sweet aroma of worship that rises to your throne put your hand on your heart say it again a pure heart that's what I long that follows hard after thee a pure heart that's what I long for a heart that follows hard after thee keep going, say it a heart that hides so that sin will not come in a heart that's undivided but one you rule and reign a heart that beats compassion that pleases you my lord a sweet aroma of worship that rises Lord, grant us your heart. And then, let us see around us the people that you want us to love. And then melt away the prejudice, melt away the racism, melt away the bigotry, melt away the stuff that only pure hearts be before you. In Jesus' great name, amen. Good to look to its word because the word really gives us principles of life and in proverbs it talks about if we would just listen to the wisdom some of the, we, we would not have the issues that we have some of the stuff oh i wish i had time that we could talk more about it but let me bless you today i want to bless you with a blessing that was written in hebrews in verse 20 of chapter 13 says this now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood here it comes may he equip you with all you need for doing his will may he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. I pray that blessing on you. Have a great week this week. because we have a very special announcement because you know Governor Newsom has basically shut down, down indoor services and so the worship uh, the the worship's going to take place literally in your cars New Hope Christian Fellowship is going to have drive-in church this coming Sunday July 19th that's just can you say July 19th That's right, July 19th. And so rather than having indoor services, 
we're going to have a drive-in church. And so you bring your car. If you have an FM radio, well, you're going to have to have an FM radio because we're not going to have a sound system. And so you'll sit in your cars and you'll listen and you'll be able to sing in your cars. And so come and join us at New Hope in Vacaville. And it begins at 9 o'clock. There's only one service, 9 o'clock. So all the indoor activity is kind of shut down. The, we've, we've kind of closed down our offices and our staff's working at home. And so come and join us, if you would. It'd be, it'd be wonderful. All right? You think everybody should come? Okay. Can you say goodbye? I love you. Goodbye. I love you. Okay. <laughs>